Hey everybody, it's Endymion, and if there's one thing we all dislike in today's media, that's when producers and other Hollywood types screw with or swap what people love in order to score diversity points. We've seen it happen multiple times in the past already, and now from some new reports, characters like James Bond and even Batman at one point were seriously close to becoming race-swapped permanently. So in this video, I'll be covering topics like this as well as why Castlevania Nocturne sucks ass, and why Miles Morales is not Spider-Man and much more. This video might get a little spicy, but hear me out, because by the end you'll understand that this is a fault with creators and not fans. And why will creators need to address their own inherent racial biases and learn to leave iconic characters alone? To start, we have this article from Screen Rant titled, Why the Next James Bond Should Be Black or Female, Explained by British Intelligence Expert. This comes from a conversation the Telegraph.com had with British intelligence expert John Taylor, who has trained operatives in agencies like MI6 for over 30 years now. According to John Taylor, he said that Bond is the biggest recruitment aid, the only thing the higher-ups I think would want to change going back to an earlier conversation, and it may happen yet, is that James Bond should be a black man or a woman, and you know it would make those sort of people also for diversity want to join. James Bond has been nothing but good. John's reasoning here makes sense from a real-world perspective since he's not looking at Bond being made black in order to score ESG points. He just wants the character to be diverse in order to inspire other people of color to join armed forces using Bond as a recruitment tactic. But thankfully, one of the producers of Bond, whose name is Barbara Broccoli, states she never wants the character to be a woman, and Bond should always remain a man. The only requirement to play Bond in Barbara's eyes is that the actor has to be British. The thing is that in my opinion, Bond shouldn't be tampered with in any way, and if the rumors that are circulating are true, Bond might even be played by Aaron Taylor Johnson and could even be directed by Christopher Nolan. While this would be a match made in heaven, as of now, it's just that, a rumor. But thinking Bond could be a woman is nothing but nonsense and would just be another legacy iconic character being retrofitted to fit modern ideals. And while some may enjoy that, it would miss the point entirely of why these characters work. Another character that was very close to being race swapped completely was actually Batman. And in early 2021, DC Comics was planning to replace their main universe with what they called the Future State where characters like Batman would have permanently been replaced with Lucius Fox being Batman instead. Future State also proposed replacing Wonder Woman with a South American-inspired version instead, and Superman would be replaced to be super gay because of course they would do this. This would effectively make the Holy Trio two people of color and one being gay, which was obviously positioned in order to score diversity points and not sales. Apparently, during these meetings, which got leaked by the way, the retailers who were a part of the discussion were insanely angry that DC Comics would even propose this change. The retailers allegedly told Dan DiDio, who was in charge of DC at the time, that if this went through, DC Comics should expect sales to drop to a third of what they are now. And as I previously reported, American comic books only make up around 9% of the profit margin when it comes to the graphic novel industry already with the other 91% being dominated by Japanese manga for good reason since Japanese creators don't race swap or pander to what the West wants. But instead, they embrace the unique strengths of what makes Japanese media so sought after in the first place. And unlike American creators, the Japanese are constantly creating new stories, characters, and IP at a staggering pace. If you're a fan of manga, you've likely heard of a new series called Kagura Bachi, that new series has exploded in the manga community, and the series cover art became an instant certified meme classic overnight. But even in its infancy, the new manga is apparently reaching past the popularity of stuff like My Hero Academia, which is crazy. But this is what I'm saying, is that the Japanese, instead of just rehashing or rebooting their mangas every six months like American comic creators do, they just come up with new stories and characters instead. And when it comes to characters like James Bond, for example, I look at him the same way I do Robin Hood or King Arthur when it comes to British culture. These icons are intrinsically tied to the lifeblood and ways of British people. 
James Bond could never and should never be an American man, for example, or a black woman. The same way that new Robin Hood series culturally appropriates the English folklore hero and strips it of all of its identity in order to race swap it to meet diversity checklists. It doesn't work, and it's not respectable towards why people love Robin Hood to begin with. In a lot of ways, if gods like Thor, Odin, and Loki are intrinsically tied to Norse mythology and are representable of Nordic people and their culture, it would never make sense to say Thor could be a black man either since his origins and culture are forever tied to the people of Nordic origin. In a lot of ways, superheroes are like American mythology characters. With icons like Batman or even Spider-Man having the same relevancy and ties to the American identity. So to change them would be as absurd as making Sun Wukong, who's a Chinese mythological character, into a trans black woman who fights the patriarchy. It doesn't do anything but completely miss the point and just changes what's unique about these characters in order to fit a new, modern criteria that nobody with common sense wants to see. It's also why the new Castlevania Nocturne series was a miserable experience to sit through. I unfortunately spent four hours of my life with my girlfriend watching Nocturne, and as a big fan of Castlevania, the series felt more like it was pandering than entertaining. Characters like Annette are race swapped and have their entire identities changed. Annette is now a black slave who escaped a colony in order to fight back her oppressors. But it's also eye-rolling to see yet another black character being reduced to the typical free slave trope. It's the same way I'm sick of seeing Slavic people being portrayed as evil military dudes or typecasting Hispanic people to play gang members. Constantly making black characters nothing but yet another vengeful slave who must fight injustice is just as tiring and boring at this point. It doesn't help Nocturne either that the writing is just garbage and Richter Belmont is written like a moron who runs away instead of helping his friends. And characters like Eust Belmont from Harmony of Dissonance are reduced to cameos that treat a fan-loved character to be a pathetic old white man, instead of a magical vampire slaying badass. The other female character in Nocturne is Maria, who's more activist than anything else. And really, when you compare the trio in Nocturne to the original series, they pale in comparison in every way. Annette is also positioned to more so be the main character over Richter. And by the end of the first season, nothing happening holds even a candle to what the original series did. The new villain just sucks. All the men are either incompetent, weak, or run away when danger arrives. And I would be perfectly fine if Netflix completely forgot Nocturne ever happened and they just moved on to something else. Because this is not Castlevania. This is just another show that misses the point of what fans loved about the series it's based on. And Annette being race swapped is lazy and this now brings me to another can of worms where people are constantly fighting which is Miles Morales. All the time people argue whether Miles is Spider-Man or not, and I want to give my take on this even though I know it'll piss people off. Miles Morales is not Spider-Man, and his superhero name is Miles Morales. By the way, I apologize in advance for how many times I'm about to say Miles Morales, but if he was Spider-Man, we wouldn't be having this debate to begin with. Even Insomniac, who makes the Spider-Man games, purposely named the spin-off game Spider-Man Miles Morales. Because they knew had they named it Spider-Man 2 and the actual Spider-Man wasn't playable, players would have been confused. When even the creators of some of the best superhero games use Miles' full legal name as a marketing tool to promote, and differ the game from the other one, that alone proves that Miles' superhero name is Miles Morales. Not only that, but you can even look at the Spider-Verse toys, which are labeled with the names of their characters. You have Spider-Man, Spider-Gwen, and then you get to Miles' toys, and what's it labeled as? Of course, Miles Morales. Even when you look up costumes for Halloween, you can type in stuff like Superman, Batman, or Spider-Man, and you'll get your search results matching what you want. But when it comes to the Miles version of his suit, even costume companies label his suit not as Spider-Man, but as Miles Morales. Basically, to suggest Miles is Spider-Man is wrong. Since, sure he has similar powers to Spider-Man, but his identity and name are overshadowed by the very obvious original main character. 
This doesn't mean Miles is a bad character. In fact, I really like Miles and I enjoy him as a Spider-Man-like character. But you're obviously lying to yourself if you suggest that Miles' superhero name is anything but his full legal name. Even in comics where Miles is the only Spider-Man-like character on the cover, his full name is presented under the Spider-Man moniker. Because even Marvel Comics knows that Miles' superhero name is not Spider-Man. I think forcing Miles into the Spider-Man mantle is pointless anyway since it only further proves that companies and creators only see legitimacy with predominantly white characters when instead Miles Morales should be given his own identity. Good examples of comics doing this are DC Comics with Nightwing and Red Hood. Both are Robins originally, but instead they grow into their own identities with their own code names and looks. You don't need to put Dick Grayson under Nightwing's name on a comic because fans know that Grayson is Nightwing. Miles is in dire need of something similar. He can keep his suits and his powers, but he can't be called Spider-Man because that character already exists. I've seen some fans on Twitter say Miles is referred to in some other media as Kid Arachnid or Spin instead of Spider-Man. Hell, even Spider-Boy would be fine. I even proposed the name Spider-Shade because Miles can turn invisible and shade into his environment. Not the greatest name, but at least it's not Spider-Man, which makes it very confusing. Look, the point here is that Miles is not Spider-Man, no matter how hard people try to force it. And it's sort of like trying to force something to become a meme or popular. If you have to force something, then it's clearly not working. And that's why characters like Miles, James Bond, Batman, and more should not have to cater to or be integrated to fit some stupid, woke, ideological nonsense. Batman is Bruce Wayne, James Bond is a British man, and Miles Morales is Miles Morales. Finally, this article from Bounding Into Comics sums up what I've been saying here perfectly with it titled, Netflix's One Piece co-showrunner reaffirms commitment to respecting source material. If you're adapting something that you legitimately love, fight for what it needs to be. Matt Owens, who's one of the co-showrunners on Netflix's One Piece, reassures fans that the show will not dilute or shy away from adapting the source material accurately, no matter how outrageous it may look in live action. During a Reddit AMA, Matt Owens spoke to fans of the franchise and he was saying a lot of things that feel alien in today's modern world. He knew it was imperative to keep everything authentic, to showcase every character as they were in the manga, and it all paid off big time since season 1 was a massive success. And as someone who's never read the manga or watched the anime, I thought it was one of the best shows that I saw all year, so it's good to see a showrunner with a sensible head on their shoulders. Matt Owens was asked what his approach to One Piece was, to which he said, and I quote, Is it absolutely necessary to be a fan of the original material? No. Is it incredibly helpful? Yes. Being a fan of something means you understand it on a deeper level. You love and study it. As a creator, my fandom helps me identify what is important for the story because I know it, but also what is important to fans because I am one. I often ask myself if I weren't working on this show, how would this potential change make me feel as a fan? I wouldn't say it made the job harder, it gave me a good position to fight for things that I believed in. My advice would be to fight for what you believe in. If you're adapting something that you legitimately love, fight for what it needs to be. Stay as true as possible while also understanding that you're not the only voice and you may not always win. But your fandom and knowledge are powerful weapons." End quote. What Owen says here is how Hollywood, American comic creators, and really anyone in charge of adapting anything should think. When you attack the audience, change things for no reason than to check diversity lists, and force characters into people liking them and calling them racist when they don't, you're doing nothing but hurting your brand. One Piece's live-action series should be the gold standard for what modern creators strive for. Because when you respect the source material and the fans, your kindness is met. And it's wild I even need to say these things sometimes when they should just be common sense. Race swapping characters proves companies only find legitimacy in tried and true concepts and see no value in anything that is usually not an established white character, whether it's Bond, Batman, and more. And maybe if they gave these characters and ideas the same level of respect that One Piece's Matt Owens did, 
the entertainment industry at large would be in a much better spot than it is right now. So stop attacking or blaming your audience and look in the mirror and realize whether what you're making is for the right reasons. And if it's not, step away, look it over, and start again. And, oh yeah, never attack your audience. Thank you for watching, subscribe, and all that other nonsense, and like the video. My G Fuel code is a great way to support the channel as well, and thanks to my patrons as always too. Have a great day, enjoy what makes you happy, and I'll see you guys in the next one.